I'm going to go up to Miami. So I thought I'd focus on Miami University. I thought I'd focus on this area to give you an idea of what's going on here. So first I'm going to talk about the Miami University bird blind. This is a structure that was built by architecture students in 2010. In 2020, it was selected as one of the top 20 facilities of its kind in the United States. And Max Streeter, who designed it, has received national recognition for this unusual design. And this sits right next to the DeWitt cabin. This is what the structure looked like when it was uh, <clears throat> first opened. Now it's a little bit more grown up. And these slots are where kids sit and look out. You'll see a chart over on the, if you can see it over there on the left, there's a chart from Sibley's Bird Guide with all the local birds. And this is used by schools. It's used by the local Audubon chapter. It's used by the Miami University Birding Club. And it's a very, very unusual uh, nationally recognized structure now. When they built it, the five guys that put it together, the first bird they saw as they were hammering away was the one you see on the left. That's a rose-breasted grosbeak. It's a migratory species that passes through here. But this is what their introduction to what they were cre creating this thing for showed. And that's the distribution you see there of the rose-breasted grosbeak in the United States during the breeding season. Now, I thought this would be interesting. We have a number of different kinds of feeders out there. The birding club at Miami University maintains those feeders. Uh, and the bird seed that sale that Audubon has raises the money to keep those feeders going. Here are two of our local woodpeckers, the smallest one and the largest one. The downy woodpecker sitting on the left, pileated woodpecker on the right. It's a male. You can see the red beneath the bill that tells you it's a male. And this is perhaps the most voracious feeder we have the common titmouse, tufted titmouse we have around here, and it thrives on peanuts. It thrives on them. It's going through the R's at an incredible rate. And people think this is a black-capped chickadee, but it is not. Black-capped chickadees are north of Route 70 in Ohio, and Carolina chickadees are south, and the difference is very subtle, and I won't go into that here, but all our chickadees are Carolina chickadees here, and all the ones in Cleveland are black cap chickadees. We have lots of bluebirds here. They are common around the feeding station. They're common throughout Oxford. They're here now. They don't leave in the winter. Many of them go south a little bit, but we still have them show up here during the winter time. But it is winter now. And so the bird on the right is a pine siskin. It has been flooding into this area. People will be seeing 10 and 12 at their feeders right now. They're voracious feeders, but they're normally in the boreal forest. The one on the left is the purple finch, another species of the winter. But we would never see this in the summer or spring. It's gone. It heads north to where it breeds. This is the O Canada, O Canada, O Canada bird. And I say that because that's how we remember its, phone, its uh, song. It says, O Canada, O Canada, O Canada. And this is another one of those boreal species that's here in the winter, but it'll be up in Newfoundland, it'll be up in Quebec, Ontario, and the northern states during the summer having its young. But it's quite common at the feeders right now. Two weeks ago, it was a beautiful sunny day. We were walking out by the DeWitt cabin and we could hear this bird calling. It was this bird calling, flying about 5,000 feet above us. And there were 38 of them in formation, flying over the fields out there. A little later, we saw them when we started to finish our walk, and there was a group of about 54 of them flying over. Any sunny day at this time of year around here, you're likely to see sandhill cranes. Right now, there are 2,000 sitting at Brookville Lake on the shoreline. They go out in the morning to feed in the fields. They go back at night to roost there. Probably, probably our most spectacular bird in the area at the moment. So Houston Woods State Park is an important bird area recognized as that by um, the National Audubon Society. Unfortunately, the funding of Houston Woods is very poor. If you go to the Nature Center right now, you'll see it's not in very good shape. It's going to be rebuilt very soon, 
but I thought I'd share a few things about Houston and why, Woods and why it's so important. So I was out there two weeks ago and looked out and I saw this group of birds on the lake. These are not my pictures, by the way. I don't take credit for these. Uh, there are many people's pictures. But this is what is called a Bonaparte gull. It's one of our seagulls that comes around here during the winter, stays here through the winter. It will leave here in the spring to nest further north. It looks quite different in the summertime because it has a black head. But at this time of year, you only see that black spot that looks like an ear spot. And there were about 80 of them on Houston Woods Lake at that point in time. There was a small group of these swimming the shoreline. This is a hooded merganser. This is the first bird I ever showed my wife when we started birding when we were in undergraduate school. It's really a spectacular bird. If you really want to see numbers of these ever around here, you just go up to uh, Buckley Road, go out that little road there, and look at the pond to the left of you, to the right of you, and there'll probably be 30 or 40 of them floating around in that pond area. Really quite a spectacular bird. Puts that hood up when it's breeding. This also was on Houston Woods Lake. This is a ruddy duck, and uh, it has a very unusual uh, characteristic because most birds do not have a penis, but this one has one that's eight inches long, an unusual factoid. And we have, we have lots of eagles in this area, and I thought I'd share what we now know. In 1974, there were four nests in Ohio, the whole of Ohio. In 2020, there's 7,000 nests in all of Ohio. Southwest Ohio, Butler County, there were eight active nests producing young here. And in the southwestern region, there was a total of 74 nests. This species essentially went extinct in the lower 48 because of DDT. And once we got rid of DDT, they began coming back. Fortunately, there were numbers that were never affected by DDT, DDT in Nova Scotia and in Alaska. And they really supplied us with the ones that came back. This is Houston Woods two weeks ago. What is going on here? Well, this is something that Butler County uh, Electric and the banding station run by Dave Russell conceived of putting in, and this is put in right by the, uh, the Nature Center area. And this is going to be a nesting pole to try to get this bird to start nesting here on a regular basis. Hey, What's Phil Morkel, how are you doing? Hang on. Let's see if I can get that. Yeah. I do. So this is an osprey. They do occur here by the numbers. How about you? If we can get them to nest and and have to on a more regular basis. This is at the beach, an unusual photograph. This is a killdeer, a common bird here, not in the winter, in the spring, summer, and fall, although there, there were 90 out at Brookville Lake on the 5th of December. Note that there are two young nestlings trying to huddle under the mother's breast here quite remarkable. If you go up to the the Blue Heron Trail parking area and walk down that trail about 50 feet, this is what you'll see, a red-headed woodpecker. That's probably the one we least see around our yards and around here, but they are here in a few places. They're at another place I'll show you in a moment. And we have some unusual birds that are migrating birds. This is a Kentucky warbler. It occurs on that Blue Heron Trail. Had a nest there last spring, had four fledglings in it. This is perhaps one of our rare, rarest of the wood warbler species that occurs here. You see it winters down in Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, and South America, and it nests here, and it's declining seriously in numbers. It's called a cerulean warbler, and it's not one that most people ever see, but it occurs on that heron trail. And this also was at that heron trail and this is our scarlet tanager. So these are birds that are part of the Oxford bird fauna that occurs around here. Randy Morgan, who used to run the insectarium at the Cincinnati Zoo, took on a project this year to see how many different species you could see in Butler County. As of last week, he had seen 221 different species in Butler County. That is a huge number. Within Houston Woods, there's a thing that Dave Russell, who teaches at the university, started, which is called the Avian Research and Education Institute, and it is a bird banding station, an official standing recognized by the Department of the Interior, and it does some incredible work. Dave is one of the 100 
bird banders who teaches other bird banders in the United States. So we're lucky to have him here. And this is him working at the banding station with his equipment. And he has a bird in his hand and he's banding it. And here you can see him working with a young person teaching him. And here he's got a band on a bird that he is, uh, that he is banded. And in his hand, he has a bird that I want to talk about a little bit. We use nets to catch the, nets like this to catch the birds. This is one of, on one of the lines there. And we have about 18 lines out there. This is just by the dam, the lower dam. And this is the bird that three weeks ago they got in the net. Now that night they caught 17 of these birds. 15 years ago, we didn't even know they came through here in migration. But now they do. These are called saw wet owls. This is an owl that's maybe about six and a half inches tall. So this is very special. Three weeks ago, they caught 17 of these in the net and banded all of them. One had been caught before. The bands are recorded in the federal system. So we were able to turn that number in and find out this bird had first been banded in La Crosse, Wisconsin a year ago. And one year later, it showed up at Houston Woods in the nets there. Very interesting phenomenon. And these are some of the warblers in the spring that will be caught in that net. The yellow one on the left occurs along the shore of Lake uh, of Acton Lake. It's the only warbler that nests in holes in trees. All the others build nests. The one on the upper right is a perula warbler. It nests here also. It nests throughout the wood wooded area here. The one at the bottom is a black Burnian warbler. It does not nest here. It's a bird of the boreal forest, but there are about, oh, 22 species that pass through here over a month's period as they head from the south to the north for the summer breeding season. And then they come back and they start showing up in August. And by the end of September, most of them are gone. And these are just the breeding ranges of these birds. And the dark orange is where they breed. And so you can see Ohio is skipped by the one that is the Black Burnian, but the two, the Perulian on the right and the Prothonotary on the left, it's in our breeding range, so we have them here. Fernald, if you've lived here long, you know Fernald has, brings on different thoughts. This is the Fernald Preserve, 14 miles from Oxford. It was where the major plutonium manufacturing took place at one three sites in the United States for the Second World War production of nuclear weapons. It is decommissioned now and has been made into what you saw here. And what it is now is a natural park. So this is the visitor center at Fernald, which hosts various meetings and they have naturalists there that do tours and Miami classes go there from both Hamilton and from Oxford. And here's a group starting out on the trail. They have a tremendous trail system. It's about 1,200 acres there with easements on another 4,000 acres surrounding it. So it's protected by a core of conservation easements through Three Valley Conservation Trust here in Oxford. And when you get out there further, you come to this station. And if you sit there in the evening, about 4.30, 5 o'clock, 5.30, this bird will fly across in front of you. This is a short-eared owl. Now we don't have them, there's some nesting on uh, Nichols Road. I mean, th that spend the winter out on Nichols Road, but that's about the closest we can find them. But down there at Fernald, we can see them at daily in that area. It's not a huge owl, but very attractive. Another bird they have there is the woodcock. Woodcocks nest here in Oxford. In fact, when we moved into our area on McKee Avenue, they were nesting in the field across from them. Now that's houses. They are nesting at the high school. We see them out there. They're not nesting at the uh, IES site, the Institute for Environmental Sciences, out on Bonham Road. But this is a bird that you don't see because it usually doesn't see it until it flies in the evening or in the early morning, although about four o'clock in the spring, you may see them do the, their breeding flights over Oxford. They do do that. Here are two birds at Fernald that are at the limits of their range in Fernald. We do not see them many other places. One on the right 
is a dick sissel. The one on the right is a blue grosbeak. Those are birds that are not common in our situation. These are winter birds that we see. The white, the white uh, crowned sparrow on the left is, was there two weeks ago. I saw it there. We haven't had enough snow to see the bird on the right, but that occurs here in Oxford. It's a snow bunny. You can see it out by the feed mill, but at just size the college corner quite often, if we get a good snow. Or you can see it by the sod farm out by Houston Woods. Several weeks ago, Bill Pratt can tell you where this was seen. It was in Kentucky. This was a snowy owl that had come down. In the wintertime, we do get these incursions from the north to the south, and we do get snowy owls occurring here. Not a lot, but we do, but that's a spectacular owl. On August 8th, in August in 2008, this bird showed up at Fernald. This bird occurs in Europe. We never see it. It's called a gargany. And we had people fly in from all over the United States to Cincinnati to drive to Fernald to see this bird because they'd never seen it in the United States. Birds are a little bit eccentric. There's a lot more at Fernald than just birds. Uh, once they decommissioned it and started letting water form in the lakes, beavers came in in numbers. In fact, they now are a problem. There's so many. Two years ago in January, we had a, bir a birding trip to Houston Woods, I mean at uh, Fernald. And on that walk, one of the people walking along said, quiet, everyone, don't say anything. And we look, and what we saw was a bobcat. There are lots of bobcats in this area. People have no idea. There are bobcats on Bonham Road. There are bobcats on Stillwell Beckett Road. There are bobcats surely in Houston Woods. They have come back into Ohio and they are here in numbers in Southwest Ohio, in Eastern Indiana, and in Northern Kentucky. Uh, rather spectacular thing. More, nobody cared about the birds once this showed up. Now, just to give you an idea, one of the 10 most significant places for people to go birding in the United States is during the last week of April and the first three weeks in May at McGee Marsh in Northern Ohio. If you think birders are crazy, the next picture will confirm what I'm saying to you. That's what it looked like in May, the first week of May, last two years ago. Last year, it didn't look like this at all because of COVID. There are probably 1,500 people out there birding. I don't go to places like this when it's like this. And vendors come here, hawking their birding trips, hawking their wares. And uh, it's a remarkable experience to go up to between Toledo and Cleveland and see what's happening during that last week of April and first three weeks of May. Now, I had any questions, but I want to show you a couple other things I want to just share with you as thoughts. The first really significant guide to birds was Peterson's Guide, published in 1934. He did something that nobody else had ever done to try to show us how we might learn birds. He put silhouettes in there to show you that different birds perch in different ways. And you could learn those silhouettes and you could know without seeing what the actual bird was by silhouette. You would always know what a pheasant looked like. You would always know what, what a bob white looked like. You'd know what a crow looked like. These silhouettes allowed people to start seeing birds in a different way without actually knowing what they were, but making it possible to categorize them. This book is published in Ohio. It was started here. It's a magazine that comes out regularly. It's probably the most important book birding guide for amateurs. Very, very interesting. It's pu published over in Athens, Ohio, and it's the Bird Watcher's Digest. It is a, it drives the economy. That pair of binoculars you see on the left there, that costs $2,100. The scope on the right costs about $4,000. Burning trips have become a phenomenon. The whole art of looking for birds has changed with the internet and with Cornell University and the different types of apps they're creating. 
the Merlin ID system. You can put on your phone. You can take a picture of a bird and your phone will tell you what it is. I don't like birding that way, but it's a technique that's being used. eBird, something that Cornell University created, now is worldwide. People enter the birds they see on their little handheld phone, click, and all that information goes into a database at Cornell University. Right now, there are about 50,000 people using eBird, recording data and sending it in all the time. A huge change. Now, this is a rather interesting. It is a new thing that's come on the market, and it's called iNaturalist. You put that up on your phone. This happened a couple of weeks ago. Bur Dave Russell was here visiting. He said, I want to show you how this works. We had a, a, a ashtray filled with shells that had been collected in Florida. He picked up a shell. He showed it to iNaturalist. An iNaturalist came back and said, it's this species. Or it'll come back and say, it's one of these five species. And it's changed the way naturalists work today. People like me who are trained to be taxonomists and be able to identify things have become prefer, superfluous because you can have your computer do it for you. I don't think it's much fun that way, but that's the way people do that. 